Welcome Sunday School teachers and Bible study leaders to our overview of LifeWay's Explore the Bible lesson of Genesis chapter 28 verses 10 through 22 with the title A Stairway for Sunday March 24th 2024. One way that you could introduce this lesson would be to just uh, talk with your class about dreams. Uh, can anyone share a dream you had that was very vivid or very important to you in some way? Maybe a particular recurring dream that you've had. I know over the years, many times uh, I've dreamed that I'm, uh, I'm late to class or can't find my way to the classroom, or I suddenly remember I hadn't been to a particular class all semester and I needed to graduate, and now I'm trying to find it, uh, something like that. Uh, you and your group can share uh, dreams like that that you've had, or you can start uh, by talking about famous dreams from history. Can, you, can your group name any uh, famous dreams from, dreams from history? You, you could share about how a century ago, Danish physicist Niles Bohr uh, was trying to figure out the structure of, of the atom. Uh, one day he dreamed that uh, atoms were like solar systems. The nucleus was the sun with electrons spinning around it. After testing the idea, he found his dream was right. His discovery won him the Nobel Prize, and he's now known as the father of quantum mechanics. It's another uh, illustration like that from American inventor Elias Howe. I've, I'll put in my uh, uh, blog notes if you'd like to look that up about uh, how he basically dreamed the invention of the sewing machine. There's several like that in history. Another option would be to share how a website listed the top dreams of each country around the world based on Google search data about uh, dreams in each, uh, in each nation. The top five dreams in the world are about dogs, uh, about being pregnant, about snakes, traveling and cheating and then in numbers one through five also inter interesting perhaps revealing that in britain the most common dream is about being pregnant in the united states the most common dream is about cheating so i don't know what that what that says but anyway one way or another if you'd like to introduce the lesson you're talking about dreams you can do that for a minute or two kind of get some discussion going then uh, you can say this morning, we're going to look at a, at a dream that Jacob had in Genesis 28 that actually led to some significant spiritual commitments in his life. Of course, our context this week, we're continuing our study in Genesis. We saw last time in Genesis 27, how Rebecca and her son Jacob deceived her husband Isaac into blessing uh, Jacob instead of his older brother Esau. Uh, as you can imagine, Esau was furious and it says when his father has died, he's going to kill Jacob. So Rebecca tells Jacob to flee to Haran, where Abraham's uh, servant uh, had, had gotten her, and then to her bro brother Laban and, and her relatives. So today's passage opens as Jacob leaves on the journey. I'd have a very simple outline for this week. Uh, just point one, Jacob's dream, verses 10 through 15. Then point two, Jacob's response to his dream in verses 16 through 22. Although I, I, I'm going to have three particular sub-point applications in that second point. So getting into the text then, uh, point one, the dream, verses 10 through 15. Verse 10 says that as he was fleeing Esau's wrath, then Jacob departed from Deir Sheba and went uh, towards Haran. Uh, you could use the, the same map, even that you used a couple weeks ago, or a similar one that shows exactly where he was going. Uh, Abraham's servant left from Hebron, and Jacob uh, left here from Beer Sheba, which was a, a bit farther south in the Promised Land. But it was a very similar trip uh, from the, the, the south of uh, uh, Palestine or, or Canaan uh, to uh, the, the same area where their relatives were from, Haran, where, where Rebekah had come from. Then verse 11 says, he came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place. That's roughing it, <laughs> having a stone for a pillow. But that stone will play a significant role in just a few verses. Verse 12 then says, he had a dream and behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Verse 13 says, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie. I will give it to you and to your descendants. God makes sure here, first of all, that Jacob knows who he is. He is the Lord. Lord here in all four caps means this is Yahweh in the Hebrew text, the God of Abraham and Isaac. This isn't just any God. This is the one true God, the God of the Bible. And uh, it may not be that Jacob had actually made him his own God yet, as, as we shall see. And then God promises him in verse 14, he says, Your descendants also will be like the dust of the earth, and you'll spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. We see here God promises, uh, God's promises to Abraham are repeated 
of how large the family is going to multiply, are they going to spread out on the land, also the purpose here of the blessings, which I believe is very important. He says, all the families of the earth shall be blessed through them. As we saw in God's promises to Abraham, God didn't just bless him to bless him. He blessed him in order that he might be a blessing to the world. Psalm 67 expands on that, and it shows that how this applies to all of us as God's people. Psalm 67 opens, God be gracious to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Why? Why, why would he be gracious to us and bless us, cause his face to shine upon us? The next verse says, that thy way may be known on the earth, thy salvation among all nations. Why does God bless us as his people? He loves us, sure. But he also blesses us so that, that's the purpose, so that we may be a blessing to the world, especially sharing the gospel with the world. And that was his purpose for Israel. He blessed them to raise up a Messiah through them who would save the world. And he blesses us today as a nation, America. He blesses us today as a church. He blesses us as individuals, not just to bless us, but so that we may be used by him to share the Messiah that he raised up through Isaac's seed, Jesus Christ, with the world. Let, let's make sure we don't forget the purpose of God's blessings. God also, also promises Jacob in, in verse 15, he says, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. So God appeared to Jacob. He made sure he knew who he was. I'm Yahweh, God of your, of your father Abraham. He promised to give him the land, verse 13, to multiply his descendants to bless the world, verse 14, and to be with him and protect him, verse 15. Now, that's a summary of what happened in that dream. But I want you to notice one other thing in, in this passage that is significant. Sometimes dreams have important symbolism. In fact, in the Lifeway Teacher's Guide, there's a good story they used to open the lesson. I might use it at this point in this lesson. It says, in her book, The Hiding Place, Corey Ten Boom wrote of a strange vision she experienced as the Germans invaded her homeland. She saw a farm wagon pulled by horses lumbering across the city square of her hometown. Corey recognized her whole family sitting in that wagon, along with some strangers moving toward a place they didn't want to go. As she and her sister Bess, Betsy discussed the, the dream, Betsy reminded Corey, God sometimes gives his people a glimpse of the future to reassure them that he is in control. So sometimes God gives us dreams that are symbolic, because of course we know that that actually did happen to Corey and, and her family. They were taken away by the Germans. God gives us dreams that are symbolic, and, and that's true here in Genesis 28. In verse 12, the Bible says, in Jacob's dream, the angels of God were ascending and descending on the ladder that Jacob saw. But we might think, oh, okay, well, whatever. But this takes on great significance in the New Testament. In John 1, 51, after Philip has brought Nathanael to Jesus, and Nathanael is skeptical at first, but then Jesus tells him he saw him under the fig tree. This impresses him, and he, he calls Jesus the Son of God. But Jesus tells him, you'll see greater things than that. He said, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Did you notice that phrase? The angels of God ascending and descending. That's the same phrase used here in Genesis 28, the exact same phrase, uh, the angels of God ascending and descending on, on the ladder. The use of these exact same words cannot be an accident or a coincidence. Jesus must be referring to Genesis 28 and, and this incident of Jacob's ladder. Why would he do that? The only difference in these two passages, if you look at it, is that in Genesis, it is a ladder that takes the angels to heaven, and in John 1, Jesus says they will ascend and descend on him. So what's he saying? Jesus is saying here, I am the ladder. He's saying, I am the ladder to heaven. What, what an amazing picture he's giving us here of how he's the ladder. He's the means of getting us to heaven. And he, of course, we know in other places in scripture, he pictures himself as the door in John 10. He says, I'm the way in John 14. He says, I'm the bread and the living water. All these things symbolize, but are basically saying the same thing that he's the way to heaven. He's the door. Here, he's the ladder. He says he, he's the way we can climb up to heaven. So this is very sim symbolic. It just reminds us again of just how important Jesus is. So take this opportunity to re-emphasize this to your class. If we want to go to heaven, Jesus is the ladder who will get us there. We must go through him. So then we come to point two. Jacob has this dream, very symbolic. Uh, God gives us all these promises. Then we see his response to the dream in verses 16 through 22. Verse 16 says, 
Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Verse 17, he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Verse 18 says, So Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on its top. Verse 19, he called the name of that place Bethel. However, previously the name of the city had been Luz. This describes Jacob's first response to the dream. He's saying this must be a special place. So, so he called it Bethel. The name Bethel literally means house of God. Beth, B-E-T-H, means house in Hebrew. L-E-L, -E short for Elohim or God. So house of God. Bethel would be a prominent place in Old Testament Israel. Uh, this lets us know uh, where, where, it came, where uh, that uh, town came from. So that, that was his first response. Then we see him make a commitment to the Lord as a result of the dream. Verse 20 says, Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear, verse 21, and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God, verse 22. This stone which I've set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. So here, Jacob makes a vow with some important commitments that he's making to the Lord in response to this dream. First of all, it is a conditional kind of vow. He says, if God will be with him and take care of him on the journey and bring him back safely. I don't think it's necessarily an expression of doubt. I think it's more like, if indeed you are who you say you are, and, and you really do these things for me, as it appears that you are, uh, then he says, then I'm going to do these three things. Here's number one then the Lord will be my God. The Lord, again, is all capitals here, which means in Hebrew, this is Yahweh, personal name of uh, God of creation, the God of uh, Abraham and Isaac, not just any God. It says God is going to be my God. This is the personal commitment now that he makes to Yahweh to be his God. So maybe before this, Yahweh was not really his God. Maybe it was just something that had passed down from Abraham to Isaac, but really hadn't made its way to Jacob yet. But now it's becoming real to him personally. And as we've talked about before, it is important for everyone to come to a time in their life when it becomes personal to them. We've been studying Isaiah 53 in our Sunday morning worship service, as I shared a few weeks ago, how when Ruth Graham was growing up, she was uncertain about her salvation. She'd grown up as a missionary's kid, and so the faith was all around her, but she hadn't really nailed it down in her own life. So she talked to her older sister about it. Her sister told her to take a passage of scripture and make it personal. Uh, one of Ruth's favorite passages was Isaiah 53. So she took that great passage and just put her name into it. Surely Ruth's griefs he himself bore and Ruth's sorrows he carried. Ruth, like a sheep, has gone astray, but the Lord laid on him the iniquity of Ruth. Uh, she made it personal and, and she found the peace that uh, with God that she was looking for when she really made it personal with him. Well, of course, it's important that each one of us comes to a time in our lives when the Lord becomes more than just our parents' God, our grandparents' God, our friends' God, or our church's God. He's got to be our own personal Lord and God. After you tell that Ruth Graham story, you might ask your group, does anyone here have a personal testimony that they, they want to share about how it became personal to them? Of course, every Christian has a testimony of it becoming personal. It's how we become a Christian. But somebody may have one of how it became personal to them in a special way, like, like Ruth Graham's testimony. Here, here's another one you could use here. Beth and Lloyd Jones, a B E T H A N. Lloyd Jones was the, the wife of uh, Dr. David Martin Lloyd Jones, perhaps the greatest preacher in England in the 20th century. But one night, as she was listening to her husband preach, she realized she had a religion based on going to church and, and trying to do good things. But she didn't have genuine salvation based on faith in Jesus and what he did for her on the cross. And that night, she put her faith in Jesus alone for her salvation. It became real for her. Each one of us has to come to a time in our lives when we make our own real personal commitment to Jesus uh, and uh, to him as Lord, like Jacob did here. Encourage your class members, if they've never done it before, to do that today. This would be a great place in the lesson to share the plan of salvation and encourage your members to make a personal commitment 
to Jesus. So he, first, he, he makes the, the Lord his God. Secondly, he says, this stone will be God's house. He says, I'm going to make this place a house of worship. And it did uh, become a place of worship in, in years to come, as I mentioned a minute ago. Later in Genesis 35, after he'd come back to the promised land, God will call Jacob back to Bethel in a time of recommitment to him. And uh, God changes his name to Israel. It was a pivotal place in his life. Then later in Judges and, and Samuel, Bethel became a place where Israel would worship God. Unfortunately, it also deteriorated and became a place where Jeroboam put to one of the two false gods that led Israel astray. But all throughout Israel's history, it had been to them a holy spot. You might ask your group, is there a certain physical spot that has meant a lot to, to them in their walk with the Lord? Maybe the place they got saved or God has spoken to them repeatedly at that spot. Maybe church camp like Falls Creek in Oklahoma, where a few years ago the International Mission Board said more Southern Baptist missionaries had made their commitment to missions at the altar at Falls Creek than any other one spot in the country. Maybe somebody in your, in your group has a place that's just special to them. It might be some interesting testimonies there. Now, I'd make the point, God is never limited by geography. You don't have to go to a certain place to hear from him. It's one of the points Jesus was making in John 4. But uh, you, you can meet him anywhere in, in spirit and truth. But sometimes a certain place will become special to us in our pilgrimage with the Lord as Bethel was here to Jacob in Israel. So he, he makes a commitment for the Lord to be his God. He, he says that he's going to raise up a, a, this, a place that will be God's house, a place of worship there. Uh, important when we commit ourselves to God, we want to be in his place of worship, we want a place to worship him. Uh, and then point three uh, in, in this uh, second point, he says, I will surely give a tenth to you. Uh, significantly here, Jacob, J Jacob commits to tithe to the Lord. He says, he says, of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Don't overlook the importance of this commitment and where we find it here in Scripture. Uh, I don't often hear this passage shared uh, uh, regarding tithing. Uh, but uh, to me, it's one of the best passages on tithing in the whole Bible. First of all, it defines tithing. What does he say? I will give a tenth to you. So a tithe is a tenth. That's just what the word tithe means. It means a tenth. Some people uh, think tithing just means giving. It doesn't. It means a tenth. And that's just what Jacob is saying here. I will surely give a tenth to you. And what does he tithe? Of all that you give me. So he's going to tithe everything God gives him. It applies to us too, our income, our salary, everything God gives us. We ought to tithe a tenth to him. Notice also here a couple of very important things about the context of Jacob's commitment to tithe. First of all, he makes the commitment before the law came. When was the law given? It was to Moses and the people of Israel in, in Exodus. But that's hundreds of years, 400 years or so after this uh, so this is 400 years or so before the law ever came. That really undercuts the argument some people make. You say, well, tithing is just Old Testament law. No, it wasn't. It was a basic spiritual biblical principle that existed before the law ever came. In fact, we've seen it tw twice now in recent weeks in Genesis 14 when Abraham tithed to Melchizedek after the battle of the kings. That was before the law. Now here again in Genesis 28, Jacob says he's going to tithe again. This is before the law ever came. So there is strong biblical evidence that tithing is not just under the law, that it was a basic spiritual principle that existed even before God gave the law to Moses that you tithe to your God of all that he gives you. You give a tenth to him. So the context here is extremely important in showing us that the tithe is an important pre-law spiritual principle. Not only that, the context of Jacob's particular commitment to tithe is important. He made his commitment to tithe in the context of his basic commitment to Yahweh as his own Lord and God, as we have seen. He says from this point on, he says, Yahweh is going to be my God. And what's going to be the sign that Yahweh is his God? He's going to show it in two ways. I'm going to build a place to worship, and I'm going to tithe. So tithing is significant because it's part of the basic commitment Jacob made to Yahweh as his God. Tithing was a mark of God's lordship on his life. And listen, tithing is a mark of God's lordship in our lives today, too. Uh, just like it, it did for Jacob. Tithing shows us, it shows God, shows the world 
that the Lord is really our God. We, we tithe everything that he gives us as a reminder of where we got it from, as a gift of gratitude back to him. And just like the people of Israel tithe to support the priests in the temple, we tithe today to support the work of the church. Now, some people like to say, but we're not under the law, we're under grace. Well, two things about that. Number one, as we've seen, tithing is a spiritual principle that existed before the law was ever given. But number two, you want to claim not under the law, but under grace? Okay, don't worry about it. You're not limited by the law or by the tithe. You are free to give as much as you want to to the Lord. Go, go way above. But I would be very hesitant to give anything less than a tithe when there is such a strong precedent in Scripture to tithe that has been given to us in passages like this before the law ever came. It gives every evidence of being an enduring scriptural principle. So you might ask at this point as you're talking about, you might see, does anybody have a question about tithing? Or, or ask, does anybody in your class have a testimony about how they began to tithe or how the Lord blessed them as, as they began to tithe? It might be a good idea for you to have somebody lined up in advance, uh, maybe a class member, maybe somebody from another class, a senior adult, somebody you know who has a good lifelong testimony of tithing. Just bring them in for a minute. Have them share a testimony of how God uh, taught them to tithe or how they've been blessed by tithing. It could really minister to some people in, in your class. My wife Cheryl and I have tithed our whole adult lives, even in what we called our, our dark years, uh, testing years, of which we have had a few, uh, just uh, starting out and then uh, more recently in, in my illness in 2012 and following. But God has always been faithful. He has always blessed and provided for us. When we left uh, Louisiana and in, in uh, early uh, uh, 2013, when I got sick, we moved to Norman, Oklahoma with an uncertain job, no future, no lasting income. We were committed that, to tithe whatever income we received, and we did. Uh, two years later, when I got well and I was getting back into the ministry, I looked back. I thought, you know what? We never lacked anything during that two-year time in the wilderness. God always provided he is Jehovah Jireh. He is Yahweh the provider. And the scriptural way we show that we are grateful for his provision is by tithing everything that he gives us back to him. Just like in the life of Jacob, one of the most important marks of God's lordship in our lives is to tithe. Jacob gives us a great example here. He made his own personal commitment to the Lord. He made Yahweh his own God. Then he showed it in some concrete ways. He worshiped God at Bethel, and he gave him the tithe of all the blessings that he gave him. It's great applications for us and for our class members as we would seek to serve the Lord today. Well, remember, if you'd like to read or print out a text version of this overview, to you can print it out and use it if you'd like to, or just get one of the quotes or stories. You can get that on my blog at www.shawneethomas.com. I'll post that address in the comment section below. If you'll hit subscribe to this video, YouTube will automatically send you next week's lesson and you won't have to search for it. If you write something in the comments below, I'll be sure to pray for you and for your group by name this week. For my licensing agreement with LifeWay, these weekly lessons are based on content from Explore the Bible Adult Resources. The presentation is my own. It has not been reviewed by LifeWay. LifeWay resources are available at GoExploreTheBible.com and GoExploreTheBible.com slash adults dash training. And if you have questions about Explore the Bible resources, you can send emails to ExploreTheBible at LifeWay.com.